On this episode, we're going to talk about starting your first army from zero to 2,000 points. Let's get to this. Sounds good. Brad, can you give me an elevator pitch for this episode? So the general idea was a lot of people ask about how do you start an army from nothing to get up to your first legal 2,000 point army. We actually threw it into our patron poll for our biannual patrons choose the episode topic, but it ended up taking second place. However, it won the popularity poll on YouTube, so I said screw it, we'll just do it in addition to the one the patrons voted for. But we have to have an example to work with. And I know that you asked us about getting your Tau up to 2,000 points because you were interested in playing an escalation type thing with your friend. Yeah, so... I'm always very impressed by the pictures you post on the Discord of all your completed models, but I don't know really where to start. And so this actually was a topic I posted in the Discord of like, how do I actually build a list? And then what points should I start out at? And how do I expand that up to larger games? So we're going to take that concept and we're going to use a specific case, which in this case is your Tau. And hopefully through that, anyone watching this can learn as they go and figure out how it applies for their faction and what they like. Yep. Hopefully this episode answers a lot of those sort of new player questions where you may have been consuming hobby content or, you know, watching painting tutorials. You have some paint, you have some models, but you're not really sure where you want to go or where you should start actually playing and understanding the game. And when we're done here, if you still have questions, don't be shy. Hit us up and we'll try to answer everything we can. There are other fantastic people in the community who can help as well. Just make sure to ask away and we'll clarify everything we're capable of. Yep. Okay, before we get to my amazing six-step process, let's talk about what we're not going to discuss in this episode. I don't want to use box sets as a crutch when we do this episode. It's very easy with certain armies to just get a load of box sets together and boom, you have 2,000 points, but it's not really what you wanted. We're going to focus on you wanting to play a certain army and without having to use a pre-constructed set, you can build up the force the way you want just by buying things off the shelf. So Brad, as somebody who is not familiar with your guaranteed six-step process, what is step one? So step one is identifying the faction you want to play with in the first place. You should read up on them in the lore a little bit. Try to see the bare minimum of the rules through very legal means, I'm sure. Definitely not going on Wahipedia to read the rules nice and easily for free. Definitely going to add that one to my bookmark. I I mean, totally, this is not a legal endorsement of Wahipedia. Basically, the point of step one is to make sure you want to spend the money on this faction before you get going. Another nice thing you could do is just try it out digitally before you put any money down on it in real life, but we're going to kind of move past step one and assume that you've found the army you want. So, which one is it for you, Mr. Is a Tau on screen right now? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, So, one of the things that really drew me to 40k when my, my shop first got their sort of Warhammer display was the Ghost Keel model. I saw that model on the shelf. I saw all the other factions in 40k. I looked at that model and I said, I want to play that model. And basically, ever since then, I've justified to myself why I would like to join the greater good and become a bona fide space communist. All right, so we're starting off with Tau. And we can move on to the second step, which is identifying what in the faction you want to play specifically. For Tau, there's a couple examples, obviously. You could go heavy into suits. You could go heavy into tanks. You could go heavily into playing the auxiliaries in Crutes and Vespids. Everybody laugh with me. But there are a few things you have to know going in about how the army functions. Tau has what is known as the Farsight Enclaves, which is a sub-faction that has different rules for putting an army together versus the rest of Tau. And there's a bunch of different ways you can have Tau play depending on your sub-faction. So is there a part of the lore or the gameplay that you jive with when it comes to Tau in general? Yeah, so my favorite part about Tau 
specifically is the battle suits. I grew up watching Power Rangers, Rip Tommy, and then, you know, as I grew up, started to watch more Gundam and then Evangelion. So for me, when I look at Tau, I want to play with the battle suits. I want to see my opponent boost around with a jetpack and then either shoot them to bits, punch them to bits, or shoot and punch them to bits. Okay. So we'll go with a Farsight Enclave focus here because you want to play a bunch of commanders in battle suits so that you get, you know, badass Gundam feel. And because of that, it means we won't be using Ethereals. Ethereals are like the main spellcasters of Tau. They are in Tau society. They are sort of the, the head of state, the leaders and like generals of the Tau forces. Yes, but the Farsight Enclave shun them because they know that they're secretly evil. Yes. Uh, Commander Farsight himself, you know, when he got the Dawnblade and like, you know, after being separated from the Tau Ethereal cast, the Ethereal in his unit was actually killed, if I remember correctly, you know, kind of broke the Ethereal's hold on the Farsight Enclaves, which make them more of the rebellious faction that is sort of fighting the power structure of the Ethereals. I am actually genuinely shocked that you do that much of your own lore. I'm impressed. Eric would would fail that miserably if I did this about Grey Knights or Orcs. I'm shocked. Yeah, the F- Farsight book is really good. I think the lore around Farsight is also really cool. I personally don't jive with the sort of traditional Tau color scheme and Tau lore, and I like to go unga bunga, and I don't want to cast spells. All right, color me impressed. So we're going to move on to step three, knowing we want to play Farsight Enclaves and we want to play suit heavy, you know, close close quarters more or less to start with, and we'll we'll broaden our horizons as we go. So moving into step three, we need to learn the very basics of army construction. We don't have to be geniuses about it or learn any of the complicated stuff. I'm not going to ask you what an outrider detachment means. We just need to know how to build a list so that we can move on and build the list. So grab a copy of your very legal core rulebook, your very legal codex, whatever you need. Go download Battlescribe and get it set up with Warhammer 40k 9th edition so that you can start putting your models that you like into it and see if it ends up as a valid list. And we'll go from there. But for this example, let's just walk through some basics. We want to play Tau Empire. We want to play Farsight Enclaves. Farsight Enclaves are not allowed to have Ethereals, but they are allowed to have two commanders and a single detachment instead of the typical Tau one commander per detachment. This is all found in the Tau rulebook. What is a detachment? So first off, everything in a 40k list has to go into what are called detachments. The basic two is a patrol and a battalion. Patrols are the ones we use at small sizes, or if you need to do multiple detachments that have a low requirement to build them, a battalion has a bit more requirement to build it. To walk you through the difference, a patrol requires you to have one HQ unit and one troop, which is the most basic infantry unit that your army has available to it. Sorry, knight players, you gotta figure out knights on your own on this one. Yeah. Do they even have a troop? No, they're built different. You have to use a heavy detachment for that, a heavy support detachment for that, which we're not getting into right now. So a battalion, on the other hand, requires you to have two HQs and requires you to have three troops. Now you're asking yourself, if I need more troops and more HQs, why would I build a battalion instead of a patrol? Because you get capped on the amount of units of each type you're allowed to play in a patrol or in a battalion. There are also army construction rules in most codices of you are only allowed one captain equivalent, or in the case of Tau, you are only allowed one commander per detachment. So you have to get a second detachment in order to play a second commander. Farsight Enclaves gets to run two commanders per detachment instead of one, but doesn't get to run ethereals. This is okay. (laughs) This is the objectively correct way to play Tau. So going into it, We'll start with a single patrol, but we're going to get capped on certain amounts of units that we can bring. So then when we get to a higher points cost later on, we will add a second patrol in. If I was playing a different army, I may just move up to a battalion, like in my Thousand Sons. But in this case, we should just take the second patrol because it'll allow us to take more commanders. 
commanders are also a really cool model in Tau, so I am on board with playing as many as possible. So with the very basics out of the way, let's move into step four, the fun part. We need to start actually building something. Let's start out with combat patrols because they are the smallest game size that is officially supported. It goes up to 500 points of models for each player. You can play against each other at this size game quite happily. It's not the most balanced, but that's okay. It's great for learning. And then we move up in game size as we go on and you just escalate things to larger and larger games as you start collecting more. Yeah, I think this is what you recommended I start out with. So really interested to see what kind of flexibility and how many different models we can fit. It is shockingly small, actually. They're really nice newbie games because of how little you need to track over the course of the game. Because of what I'm starting you off with to act as the core of your army, you actually get very little in models and units to play with at this size. You could, like really slant something at this game size to either have super large model that costs a ton of points that's very hard to deal with or play a lot of very cheap models to try to swarm your opponent it's easy to break this game mode try for balance list when you go for 500 points with your friends the combat patrol boxes that are up on the shelves are always a pretty solid equal footing for most of them there are some exceptions of course Okay, the goal of these games isn't to spike out your other friend who just picked up a combat patrol. It's to sort of understand the basics of the army and, you know, understand a lot of the sort of groundwork or the foundation that your army is going to be built on top of. Correct. Don't play this one as hard as you can because it's not it's not meant to have you try breaking it. You will be successful. Sometimes you will be successful at that on accident. You just bring one knight, right? No, you legally can't. Um, There's actually special construction rules for knights in 500 points games. They must bring three war dogs, specifically because of what you just thought of. (laughs) So yeah, at 500 points, they're forced to bring three war dogs. Knights is a super special case compared to everybody else. Gotcha. So let's talk about what I put in here for you. We wanted to start with at least one commander because that's why we're here so i tossed a cold star commander in i gave you a unit of troops to fill out that requirement in just 10 breachers they're the close range version of the fire warrior box it has like multiple builds you'll get used to that when you're figuring out what to buy for your army there are often boxes in 40k that build multiple units the cold star commander can also be built as the enforcer commander Okay, and they just use different bits depending on which model you're building. Yes. Like with the Lord of Change, you can build them as another big bird that has a different name in the rulebook, but they all come in the same box. Yes, you can build it either as Lord of Change or Kairos Fate Weaver. Gotcha. I appreciate that you said another big bird, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, moving back to your army... We now have a bunch of points left over with those two things taken care of. Let's burn them all on a single unit. It's time for you to meet the bread and butter of Tau, specifically Farsight Enclaves, which is your crisis suits. No, yeah, really excited to get in with some crisis suits. Okay, with them in there, technically there is a bunch of points left over. However, Tau is one of those armies that you can tell is like older because you get a trillion options. And you have to build up your individual units with a bunch of options that cost points to get your final result. We're going to be burning a bunch of points on equipping them with their weapons and adding in a couple of drones so that you can see the basics of how drones work, which is another key aspect of how Tau works. So just for an example, I'm not going to talk about the specifics all the way through all of these lists because we'd be here for like 10 hours talking about Tau like that. I'm all for that. Yeah, you might be, but I need our our view counts up. So (laughs) on the crisis suits, I'm going with a very generic loadout that you can build in the box, which is just a burst cannon, a plasma rifle, and a tau flamer. We're going to upgrade one of them to be an iridium battle suit, which is just a you say it is, which is the sergeant equivalent, which is a chasvri, chasvri, I don't know my tau very well. Chasvri. We'll also add on a pair of shield drones to the unit so that you can see how drones function in gameplay. Yeah, I think they changed the rules from 8th to 9th. They did. Definitely going to need a refresher on how drones work nowadays. 
And because we've got the extra like 15 points in this list or 20 points or whatever, we'll just do one more shield drone on the cold star. We'll probably cut it in later variations. The nice thing with Tau is you get a lot of play when we move up in points. With other armies, you may have awkward moments where if you're not overspending and buying extra units, you may end up at a weird point where the models you want only add up to like 875 points because the next model you want puts you over the 1000 mark. Mm -hmm. Tau has so much play in what you can choose option wise and how many drones are in each unit and all that, that you can always fudge the numbers in the end. Gotcha. And that's why I recommend if you are building crisis suits, magnetize them. Or I'll give a counter recommendation, which is glue what you want on your crisis suits, glue whatever options look cool to you onto your units for now little things like weapons don't matter enough for people to be like looking very closely at their opponent's model to see what it's got sculpted on as its generic gun especially if it's not an imperium model because i guarantee you 80 percent of players cannot tell you the difference between a plasma rifle and a tau flamer on a tau unit because i can't and i helped my wife build her tau I've built Tau, and I still don't know the difference between a burst cannon, a plasma rifle, and a flamer. The only one I can identify is a burst cannon, because it looks like a chain gun. Yes, true. <laughs> the burst cannon is a chain gun, and... Everything else is an indescript rectangle. So, don't fret the details like that. Okay. But yes, Tau is a very fun magnetize army, should you choose to go the psychotic route. I edit for you, so I think I am that kind of psychotic person. That's fine. And for those wondering at home, if you're not watching this on YouTube and you're just listening to it, or you're on YouTube and you want to see what the detailed version of these lists look like, there will be a link in the show notes to a nice text version of these Battle Scribe lists so that you can see what my specific examples were for Cactar here. Now, before we move on, there is a nice last point here, which is this is only three boxes, even without you know, using a combat patrol or something for a pre-made combo box. Yeah, so we've got the commander in the Cold Star battle suit. That's one box. We've got a unit of breacher teams, which, like we said earlier, those come in the fire warriors box. And then you have the crisis battle suits, which should have all the different bits and bobs you need and should come with at least two drones that you can build as shield drones, marker drones, or gun or turret drones. Yeah, and... Specifically for Tau players in the audience, by the time you're done building your army, you will have more of every drone type than you could ever need. Don't fret what ones you build. Just build whatever ones you have the least of now. Alright, so now we get to move on to step 5. We need to grow our way up naturally to 2,000 points from 500 points. Let's move up to the next stop point here, which is going to be 1,000 points. So at 1,000 points... We're talking about what is called an incursion game. It's a bigger game. You get more CP to start with. You aren't forced to play a patrol detachment at this point. You can play whatever you want as long as it's legal and you've got the CP to burn on the detachments. <laughs> so the unfortunate part for Farsight Enclaves when we go up to 1k here is we're still kind of building up what makes you play the style that you want. So we're not adding too much this time. It's going to get more variety as we move up to 1.5k and 2k in this collection. You could, again, buy these in different orders and play things at 500 points differently and play things at 1k differently. That's not that important. As long as you enjoy what you're building and it's you know playable at that point size, you'll be fine. So for this build, I added on a second box of crisis suits we're going to build two of them as normal crisis suits and then the last one we're going to put to the side for a second we added on another 10 breachers so a second box of them and we added on stealth suits so a box of stealth suits which are adorable they are tau has a lot of really cool looking units these again i'm going to say this a lot they're some of my favorites one of the ones i think i actually finished painting and basing over my four years of collecting tau so with the last crisis suit, we are going to build it as a crisis commander. This unfortunately is one of the many armies in the game where when you make an HQ unit, you don't have a dedicated model for that. Custody players, Grey Knight players, you're all going to be familiar with this. How do you make your shield captain or your 
grandmaster you just doll up a normal troop model to look extra fancy and there you go i think specifically in tau the way you would designate a unit as a commander is usually with different markings and specifically i believe a different colored head so if you're playing farsight enclaves you may use like a white head uh, if your model is painted red or if you use like maybe a gray head or when I was thinking of building Viorla, I believe they specifically have like the red head, but don't quote me on that. So for a more abstract solution, the normal way you'll see people do it is to put some extra rock equivalent on the base so that it's standing up taller than everybody else. You might want to do it in a cooler pose than the generic model equivalents are all standing in. Maybe put some bits from your buddy's army on the base is like a dead guy all cute different solutions to make it so that you can obviously from a distance go that one's the important guy who's different so with the units selected we just give them all the war gear they need we add on like a pair of marker drones to the stealth suits so now you've got a second type of drone to figure out how to play with uh, this is also when you'll start dealing a lot more with marker lights which is a tau mechanic and it's good because, in my opinion, at 500 points, it's one more mechanic you have to figure out and play with when you should be learning like the very basic rules of the game. And then you can move up to 1k and start really figuring out your army's specifics. Yeah, when I played my first game in 8th edition, I don't believe I brought any marker drones. And I'm glad I didn't learn that because it all got changed when 9th edition came around. So glad we're saving that to later in your journey of collecting. So with those three boxes added to your army, you're playing at 1k for a while. You'll probably want to stay at this size, play a few games, uh, get to know your army a bit more, figure out what you like and what you don't, and then you'll start piecemealing from here your way up to 2k. We'll give a specific example, but again, at this point, you should have started to feel things out, and you'll have more of a gut feeling on which way you want to go. Yeah, there are a lot of different ways to play Tau. There's not just the far side enclave route. You could go more traditional Tau Sept and build more into Riptides. Certainly not at this point cost, but maybe at the next one that we get to, the 1500. But you could also go Borkan or Sakea Sept and like you could do more Ghost Kill stuff, try to be more of a sneaky army, or you could be more, you know, castle up and be more traditional gun line. So there's still a lot of the, the models that Brad suggested so far are quite flexible in what type of army they can go into. Breachers maybe not as much so as Fire Warriors. Oh no, 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 no. You misunderstand, my friend. Breachers are the only troop you're going to use that aren't called Crute. Oh, that I, I should go let my Fire Warriors in my travel case know that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so one of the things with our base suggestions that I made you when we originally did this is all of the low point cost things I recommended are things you're going to use no matter which way you end up. Even if you end up disliking how Farsight Enclaves plays after playing a few games and you try playing it in a different fashion, you're going to not have wasted your money on these models. Which is, I think, a good lesson at the early point costs. Maybe don't go for the hardest slant to your army. Stick to, like, core usable models you want to make sure you start with a balanced core where no matter which way you end up enjoying the army you can move in that direction as you start collecting yep you want to get a good foundation using a lot of the core and iconic units so that you can sort of feel out how you want to progress and develop your collection now to show two variations of that with the 1.5k list and the 2k list i'm going to go to different directions in the 1.5k list we're going to keep saying that you like far sight enclaves you want to go this route you want to get up in people's faces and play very aggressive so if that's the case we're going to move up to 1500 points our next stopping point we are now within strike force which is the 2000 point cap game mode but you can play it at different point costs under there so you just say we're playing a 1500 point strike force game and at 1500 points we're going to be looking to add more farsight enclave based aggressive units uh 
when we move to this point cost, I also want to move to being two patrols instead of one because I want to have more commanders because that's why we're in Farsight Enclaves. Are there any other benefits for going multiple detachments? You get more slots to put things in. So in this case, uh, you're allowed to have up to two HQs per patrol Mm -hmm. and we're going up to four HQs. So I couldn't use a battalion to get a fourth HQ slot. I have to do two patrols to get that. Or a battalion plus a patrol or whatever. Gotcha. Then if we wanted to add more elites at this level, which we aren't doing in this example, but that would be another reason is if you capped out on your elites in your first patrol, then you want to do a second patrol or upgrade to a battalion where you get more elite slots. Mm Mm-hmm. All of those different reasons to change what you're doing at each size. It's not a big deal. You change it game by game. Gotcha. This is something that you'll sort of get a feel for as you acquire additional units. Maybe you get a fast attack and then you want a a fast attack focused thing that I don't know the name of. But you would do if you want to do like four different fast attack units in a single detachment, you would play an outrider. Gotcha. So if I wanted to go to the store, pick up a couple piranhas. I then would want to use those in the Outrider Detachment because I can only have two fast attacks in a, in my patrol. Correct. Now in 40k, there is the rule of three, which is you are maxed out at three max size units, whatever that happens to be for each specific unit type, at 2,000 points. And at 1,000 points or under, it's capped at two. Okay. So to put it another way, in your piranha example, you can have up to five piranhas squatted together. Oh, okay. They can be in a single squad, and you can have up to three squads with any number of piranhas in them. That's a lot of piranhas. Or three. (laughs) You could just have three. All right, so at this 1,500 points, we're going to be buying four boxes and another character clamshell. So the character we're adding in is just a cadre fireblade, which is... HQ focused on helping out the breacher squads and making them much more of a threat. And then we're going to be grabbing a couple boxes with the Enforcer Battle Suit, which is again the same as the same box we bought originally for the Cold Star, but now we're going to build the Enforcer. We're going to add in 10 more breachers so that you have the ability to have troops in three different spots at once. We're going to add a broadside to act as a backline fire support unit can park on a back point or hide partially behind some cover to make it harder to hit for key parts of the army and blow up their tank in the back or whatever. A nice unit to have, even if it's not on theme with the rest of this list, and it might start branching you out in what you like in the army. And then finally, we'll wrap it up with a devilfish, which is your transport in Tau, and it's how you can jam the breachers up to midfield really early and start threatening everybody with some Tau shotgun diplomacy. And then to make all the points balance out after we equip everybody and all that jazz, we'll move some drones around and get all that sorted. And voila, we have this 1500 point list. Yeah, it's a lot more of what we've seen in the 1000 point list. We're getting some more breachers, we're getting a Kadra Fireblade, and we're getting a broadside. So you said the broadside is more of a kind of rear heavy support. If I found that I enjoyed that part of the Tau army, how would I go to add some more backline support to a list? All right. So I'm glad you asked. Let's move into the 2K list, Cactar, where we'll focus on other parts of the army. So this is going to round us back out a bit so we're not so slanted towards up close and personal stuff. We could just add 500 points worth of crisis suits and another devil fish or something so that you can get really up there and play close range if you really want to get into far side enclaves and how they play. Mm -hmm. But let's branch out so that we can start collecting Tau as a whole and maybe you start playing different sub-factions when you're bored of how a certain sub-faction is playing. Maybe you go for a more Tau Sept gunline heavy game plan sometimes. Or maybe you go to your local game store and they have a Riptide on sale and you say, I want that model. Sometimes you just end up at the store and walk out with something you didn't expect you were going to. Yep, or a family member hears that you collect Tau and they buy you a Riptide. You're friends with Brad and he's trolling you and buys you even more orcs knowing you haven't assembled the last batch that you were supposed to assemble months ago. Eric! Get on that, Eric. You don't even have to edit the podcast, and you you still haven't assembled your boys. Come on. He has so many orcs piling up as he's slowly assembling the first ones. I can't talk. I have a lot of gray Tau plastic. He's not here to point 
fingers in my direction for my problems. So one-sided arguments. Mwahaha. So to get back to this, when we get up to 2,000 points, we're just going to make this one real simple. Two boxes. One, a ghost keel. Two, a riptide. Love me a ghost keel. And I think the riptide is like still my favorite Tau model. Though I have a, a soft spot specifically for the Cold Star Commander. I love the pose of the Cold Star Commander. Yes. Really, really well done model. Uh, Tabletop Tactics has a gorgeous one they use on their show that's so freaking cool. It's on like steel beams and is like jumping off of them. Nice. But I will say, if you watch the What is Every Faction's Mascot, I will concede that the Riptide is the objectively correct choice when it comes to the most iconic Tau unit. So these two cost a lot of points. The Ghost Keel is almost 200 points. The Riptide is almost 300 points. And uh, that almost got us to the 500 points we added on here to get to 2k. So the rest of our points are just going to get spent on adding drones to the Riptide and changing around some drones in other places. Yep, drones are pretty flexible. Add them in as you have points. Add whichever one you feel like running. You could also change out War Gear at this point, but I didn't want to do that in the example because it's going to get very confusing if I'm constantly shuffling around what guns everybody has equipped every time we move up a stage here. Yep, and nobody likes trying to remove plastic from models. Which again is why it doesn't matter. Glue what you like on them. So what kind of roles do the Riptide and the Ghost Keel play in the Tau army now? It may be a bit off topic, but... No, it's it's important to know because... This is going to play a lot less like Farsight Enclaves compared to the rest. The Riptide is very much your backline fire support guy. Okay. They can survive if they end up charged. They they aren't as frail as certain other parts of the army. Like a, a broadside, if you look at it, it's going to die. Mm-hmm. The Riptide is getting sturdy for those extra points in addition to its extra damage output. When it comes to the Ghost Keel, it's actually a model i could use as an example of it pays too much for too many different rules that can't all work at the same time to get back to a problem we mentioned on the the rules for different units episode ghost keels suffer a bit from having conflicting rules they're paying points for but that's not an issue to worry about long term that's something to worry about for this week if you were to go play one Mm -hmm. when you're collecting models It is, again, very important to remember by the time you are done buying them, building them, painting them, playing them, the rules or their points at minimum will probably have changed. A whole edition went by between mine. I'd like to pretend you're more of an extreme case, but to be honest, I know our audience. There's nothing wrong with being a hobbyist. You don't have to play the game. It's true. It's true. that View counts on videos on YouTube, I'll tell you that one. (laughs) So the the ghost kill kind of... It's an all-rounder. It's a bit of a more... Jack-of-all-trades, master of none. Yeah, you can build it a couple ways. The way I built yours in this list is to be very much a heavy tank deleter type. Mm-hmm. If some lighter vehicle ends up near midboard, the ghost kill can slide over and just delete the thing. The Ghost Keel also has the nice thing of it can advance deploy with the stealth suits. They can all like pop up mid-board at the start of the game, which is kind of neat. And again, it does mean it it does more with Farsight Enclaves than the Riptide does, which is much more generalist Tau. Mm-hmm. But both of these are really nice to just have access to in your collection. And while they won't make for the strongest slant list at 2,000 points for your first 2,000 points, I never recommend trying that anyway. You should always branch out a bit, figure out what you like early. Realistically, guys, you are going to buy more than 2,000 points of your army. It's going to happen. By the time you have 4,000 or 5,000 points of models, having variety in what you can play is important. So we've got 2,000 points here, Brad. Where do I go from here? I've got you know, a good supply of core units, not to be confused with units that have core. And how do I expand my collection? Like, what are some things I should look at? So from here, we get step six, which is just expand as you see fit. Enjoy the grind. Uh, Like I said, you're going to start collecting past 2000 points. You'll have figured out by this point what parts of the army you like, what ones you didn't think you would like originally, but now you kind of want to move into is like, 
more of a secondary slant to have to your collection so that you can have a little variety in how you play. Maybe now that your army is mostly slanted towards aggressive close range play, you want to start branching out towards a second Riptide or you want to add some Piranhas in because you like them. Maybe you want to get yourself a Hammerhead and try out Tau Tanks, which I didn't include here. Maybe you want to paint an airplane. Maybe go out and buy a Sun Shark, paint that up, and then play it in a list and see how you like that. It's not important at this point. It's just naturally growing your collection now. There's a lot less wrong choices than you think there are when you're doing your first 2,000 points or your first 3,000 or 4,000 or whatever. You're going to be fine. Yeah, the point the point part of what makes Warhammer great is to me the a lot of the enjoyment you get is out of the process and the journey. You're you're not like buying something as a one-time use consumable, right? It's not buying a new model or maybe building a new army is not like buying a new a new paint. You're going to slowly, you know, Build what models you have. Enjoy that process. Use it as like your meditative after work time. Like you're going to continue to get use and have fun with what models you collect, what models you are working on, and what models GW releases in the future. You know, it's not a one and done thing. Yeah. And as a final piece of advice from my end of things, I will tell you, don't rush it. As much as I like making fun of Eric for not finishing his models, it's not a big deal Go at the pace that you like. If you and your friends stay at 500 to 1,000 points for the next six months, it's not a big deal. You don't have to just jump all the way in the deep end like I would because I'm a psycho. You can just build your way up over time in your army. So don't worry too much. Go at your pace. Enjoy the process. And again, if you have any follow-up questions or concerns, don't be afraid to talk to us here. We're always willing to help those who ask in the comments on YouTube or email us or whatever whatever makes you happy. All right, that does it for this week's topic, though. Let's get out of here. Sounds good. Sounds good.